Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As you are aware that our prestigious Test Council of India leaves no stone up down in continuing the medical uh, education in the field of pulmonary medicine and to cover each and every topic rather than each and every disease in its all possible aspects. So here we are today to discuss about one of the most challenging and difficult disease to diagnose and manage which is interstitial lung disease. I, Dr. Mayak Saxena, host of the show, welcome you all joinees aboard to witness one of its kind webinar on the uh, ILD. Tonight our first speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Nitin Abhyankar who is uh, a stalwart and a, a one of the known figure in the field of pulmonary medicine. He is a Bhishma Pitama of Intervention Pulmonology. Uh, he is working at Pune Hospital in Pune and uh, he will be speaking on basically the diagnosing part from the history to the lung biopsy. And uh, second speaker for our uh, today's webinar is Dr. Hinappa Birnoor. He, he, will, he is the most emerging and dynamic pulmonary medicine, pulmonary medicine specialist in uh, Bangalore and he is working at Columbia Asia Hospital and uh, Baptist Hospital and uh, he will be speaking on basically the management part from uh, like uh, voidance to the lung transplantation. So we are extremely extremely thankful to CCI especially Dr. Anish Krishna who has literally kept the flow of knowledge flowing with these webinar series and so I welcome you aboard again in this wonderful show sit back relax keep calm and uh, as we take off any questions during the presentation are most welcome thank you good evening my friends from CCI and it's my pleasure and privilege to talk with you on a topic which is very close to my heart interstitial lung disease or GPLDs if you would like to call it. I am going to talk about the diagnostics and I am going to try and illustrate that to you how I proceed from a history to a biopsy and sometimes the whole thing gets mixed up and how the whole story goes and that's the journey from a history to biopsy in ILD diagnostics according to me. So we start with our very first case and here is a lady which came to us from uh, Aurangabad and this lady had certain interstitial lung disease and as you can see it, it is there. This patient was admitted in a hospital in Aurangabad. She had dyspnea, cough, weakness, so on and so forth. She was hypoxemic, tachypneic, was given steroids. I can't read out the entire details but you can make out that she was also discharged on steroids and also these are the CT findings which are there, which practically show you that there's a great deal of clearing over the period of time. Now, this patient comes to me after two months and has this time a cough and a dyspnea, which has come there all over again. So we start thinking what is going on with her. And we do a CT scan and the CT scan is showing that these lesions have come back again not exactly in the same fashion, but there is some kind of a uh, lesion which has come back. When we look at it, we start investigating it. And of course, we subject her this time to a bronchoscopy and a bronchoalveolar lavage and a transbronchial biopsy. And then the gram stain is negative, as you can see. There is no acid fast bacilli on the ZN stain. Uh, the gene export is negative. And the cytology not really contributing much there. It's a mild inflammatory smear. And then the histopathology throws up the first surprise, which none of us at that point in time saw it coming. On this particular slide, you may not see it, not even on this, but you start seeing certain something in the alveoli, and that is something which I will bring your attention to. And then you look at a little more carefully in the low power cuts also, you see that filling, and now, if I put a correct stain, then you know now what I'm talking about. This is pneumocystis carinia and pneumonia. And this particular patient was a pneumocystis carinia and pneumonia with focal organization uh, changes. Then uh, if, if we looked at the whole story backwards, and then after all these two months, 
the previous doctor had missed it i had missed it and what we had missed it which the official uh, guidelines have been telling us is the first point in the history of trying to work up a interstitial lung disease whether the person is a immunocompetent host or a immunocompromised host and we had missed out on the fact that she was immunocompromised and therefore whatever interstitial disease that she had earlier maybe it was an lip maybe it was some other disease this time because she had received steroids she possibly developed uh, the pcp and the pcp became apparent that was picked up when we did a bronchovalvular lavage and a bronchial bronchial i mean a transbronchial lung biopsy so that of course it even a lavage would have picked it up but the idea is the whole the very first point in the history taking was missed by us both and that's why history so very important in diagnosing any interstitial lung disease we move on and try and learn a little more about the history now here is a patient who is showing this kind of an x ray lesion this person was a 38 year old bank clerk and this person was having a exertional dyspnea which had reached a proportion where he was already hypoxic on room air he could be oxygenated and the oxygen level could be brought up we were trying to think of a biopsy we took him on a biopsy table for a thoracoscopic lung biopsy that is how we do it medical thoracoscopic lung biopsy and looking at the whole thing we were not sure whether why a 38 year old person should have a honeycombing plus minus but the honeycombing is also in the upper lobe so all kind of funny pictures there and a bank clerk at that occupationally and uh, then he had some other work up which was not really contributory and then what happened was something which happened on the operation table while this person was there on the operation table i realized that the anesthetist and the patient were talking to each other about you no know, what are you doing and what kind of hobbies you have and then he said oh, uh, i have a lot of pigeons and then said how many pigeons i said 500 pigeons 500 pigeons for how long so it, i have been having this from my childhood so 35 years of exposure just because he was a bank clerk from a very early childhood he was exposed very heavily to the birds and it was a hypersensitivity pneumonia once again the diagnosis of course the biopsy was cancelled uh we eventually did a pigeon antigen which was documented to be true and once again what it tells us is that of course was that an environmental entity which is there in the algorithm once again so if i if i could find the environmental entity which was relevant and then of course we removed him from that he didn't do all that well because by the time he had come to us he was already very advanced fibrosis and he survived or he improved immediately on oxygen and uh, then on steroids but he could not survive beyond 2 years and at that time we were not really doing lung transplant so well so we lost him after about 2 years but we almost biopsied him without being there there being a necessity of biopsying him just because we had missed it out because we were assuming is a sedentary bank clerk with no exposures and this particular hobby was discovered by the anesthetist while talking to the patient on the operation table uh this is third one uh a 50 year old female owner of a small food industry diabetic detected about 2 years back on oral uh jaldra and metformin 10 units of lantus insulin at night started reporting to our opd 2 months before this story unfolded this dyspnea that she had was exertional but worse at night and she also had fever which was off and on her spirometry showed us some amount of restriction with some amount of fvc increase in the post bronchodilator phenomena so we initially tried form uh, ics laba there reported after 2 weeks with worsening dyspnea cough and now she was getting intermittent high grade fever and then admission was nearly forced into the hospital because this patient was reluctant to get admitted we looked at the ct and I'm, i'll show you the ct very soon we thought at that time time that we were looking at a community acquired pneumonia we also had an h1n1 going on so oseltamivir piperacillin tazobactam azithromycin and steroids went in 
this was what her city looked like and if you really look at the city uh, it is doesn't look like a very convincing community according to me it's little more than that and that little more than that is by basel a significant amount of consolidation which is distributed more in the basis and you would probably call it by basel alveolar infiltrates with some amount of ground glass changes in some areas and not able to appreciate much of traction bronchiectasis i'm sure you would not call this pulmonary edema so this i'm answering it uh, and not giving it as a poll question here so this is the answer the diabetes control improved over the next few days with our efforts is bron we managed a bronchoscopy but only a bal could be done because the patient was having increasing dyspnea the reports at that time we were doing h1n1 swabs so not like our corona swabs at that time and that came negative procalcitonin was very low bal showed no organisms ab was negative there was no bacterial growth on the culture the pcr for tuberculosis which was done at that time was negative cnk pnk were negative but the ana came positive in strong titers and it was i think if i am not wrong it was a nucleolar one ana blot showed ro52 ssa and ssb as all positives and then we revisited the past history and that's what brings us to the history part of it again she said that she had been to the ophthalmologist thrice in the last one year for eye dryness she had actually accused a dentist of some wrong treatment because she had developed severe dryness following some dental procedures twice in the last one years and her diagnosis was chogren syndrome primary do aip acute interstitial pneumonia which we she which she presented with is not the hallmark of it it would i would have been either a lip or an nsip uh, but she had all the other features character conjunctivitis sicca xerostomia she was an a positive and we also at this point in time thought about autoimmune diabetes but it didn't turn out to be like that this particular patient was very well responsive to the steroid this is the kind of a picture that you are seeing after a few months and has it was on azathioprine now she is on mycophenolate so slowly uh, she has got blood better this is not her her this is a picture of a patient where her, her sister who also is a stogren syndrome and therefore this brings us to the part 4 of the algorithm so let's go one by one back from up to here to here if i am looking at an interstitial lung, interstitial lung disease i think first make sure that he is a immunocompetent host i take a very proper history physical examination do routine labs recent and old chest x rays are to be looked at pulmonary function test look at whether it's a chronic progressive stable what kind of a disease it is if there is an avoidable antigen like pigeons in that particular case is there a drug there amiodarone or something like that so is it iatrogenic all that if the removal takes care of it you still don't have to go any further if there is no improvement that then you go ahead with certain serological tests like what we did in this particular lady scenario where the ana and the ana blot eventually gave us the serology for specific connective diseases here in this case it is jogren it could be an rild so on and so forth in some situations you may require a biopsy of the either the skin muscle sinus nasal uh, septum kidney various uh, depending on what kind of a situation that you are looking at so that's how that algorithm goes so let's move forward a little further and take one more case here is a 50 year old male a chronic alcoholic the alcoholic liver disease presented with alcoholic hepatitis and ongoing bleed, parietal bleeding his workup revealed deranged liver functions uh, deranged liver functions and an inr of 2.45 incidentally he also had suspicious miliary infiltrates which were discovered uh, on the ct abdomen upper cuts the bronchoscopy and a transbronchial lung biopsy was done under a ffp cover we were a little desperate to really document it because we were not to sure whether with this kind of a liver is he going to tolerate it or not this is the ct image and you can appreciate a few uh, miliary nodules there 
and then it is a what would be a bronchoscopy or a transbronchial lung, bio, uh, lung biopsy. Uh, lung, uh, the bal may or may not have given us in miliary, but if we have a disease, for example, in an ILD, which is suggestive of a sarcoid or a berylliosis or a hypersensitivity or lymphangitis or eosinophilic pneumonia, you are justified in doing a bronchoscopy or a transbronchial lung biopsy. And in certain situations, it will be diagnostic. So that is on, we are on that particular part of the algorithm at this point in time. And we had the diagnosis sorted out. There was a in addition, there was a Klebsiella which we had to treat. It was a drug-resistant Klebsiella, but the tuberculosis was very much there, and that was seen in the transbronchial lung biopsy. And you can appreciate certain uh, caseating types of granulomas on this biopsy. And that particular diagnosis was clinched because we went ahead with a, a biopsy under FAP cover. So that's that's the. Um, final diagnosis of tuberculous inflammation, ameliorated tuberculosis in this particular patient. So that's how the whole case got sorted out. Uh, we move on and take one more case, which is a 69-year-old male who's having slowly progressive dyspnea over the last one year or so. Now, here is the case uh, showing, I'm showing you the radiology of this patient. And you can appreciate that there are things which are wrong in the basis in this particular patient again that seems to be dominantly reticular these are some of them are the prone images uh, and we are trying to look at what is going wrong here and uh, yeah so that's that's what they have reported a mild diffuse emphysema which persists even in the expiratory phases suggestive of small airway resistive disease these there are changes of ild with an acute exacerbation predominantly involving the lower lobes and the periphery of the left lower lobe features are non specific natures and the possibility of an active nsip is likely of course you could debate upon whether you are looking at this as an nsip or not so i'm just just going to browse through these images one more time just for your uh, visual confirmation of it and of course, in this particular patient, a bronchoscopy or a TBLA also would not have been enough. Some kind of a surgical lung biopsy is required or a, or a bigger biopsy sample is needed. You could be doing a cryo biopsy also in this particular situation. We personally, in our unit in Pune, our Pune Hospital, we do a transbronchial, uh, I mean, uh, medical thoracoscopic lung biopsy. And this is his medical thoracoscopic lung biopsy. And you can appreciate that there is a certain amount of architectural distortion. And you can also appreciate certain areas of uh, fibrogenic foci. And then this is what we kept on debating about. These two small amount of uh, ill-defined granulomas in the background of this entire disease, which was otherwise behaving or looking like a UIP at this point in time, apart from these two granulomas. And this particular patient has been on perfenidone alone, and he has been doing very well for the last two years. He is tolerating a dose of 1800 milligrams per day. And this is the first time when we have shown you a surgical lung biopsy being used in this particular scenario. Let's move on a little further and look at this very interesting radiology. You can appreciate that there are certain amount of nodular opacities which are there all over. And this case went to some other unit first and they did a CT guided biopsy of a nodule which was there in the lung base. And this particular biopsy we thought was a good idea. There was nothing wrong in it, but it was negative. And what they got was an HP suggestive of a lymphoplasmocytic inflammatory lesion. So we were not sure as, as to what are dealing with. So uh, with that, we were left into a zone where we were thinking of malignancy. We were not too sure what, what we are looking at. So we said, let's do a bronchoscopy because the bronchoscopy was not done. So we did a bronchoscopy and we had a station seven node also, though it was a small one. And uh, we did a, bi a, a TBNA also, EBUS TBNA also, and we also did a transbronchial lung biopsy. The EBS, EBUS TBNA was a reactive lymph node with occasional histiocytic aggregate. So again, it really did not help us much, but the bronchiolar lava showed acid fast bacilli. And then we thought, yes, we have hit a diagnosis here. Uh, the, um, 
there was a gene expert which did show a positivity and it was there was no reform pathogen resistance so the person was put on att uh, and then after 2 months we realized that this person is not realistically getting better and uh, though her cough went away so there was possibly an element of tuberculosis which we had picked up in addition to something else and that something else started becoming apparent after 2 months when the patient came for a follow up and at that point in time we did an work up which included anka and pnk and the uh, the pnk in this case was uh, strongly positive and the ana blot assay also was positive which was the uh, uh, um, mam2 ssb ro52 and ssa so uh, we had a eventual final diagnosis of an anka associated vasculitis being made which was responsible for those nodular shadows the tuberculosis was a red herring though it was there and we have continued and completed tubercular therapy and now she is on the relevant immunosuppressions which uh, she is doing well with here is case number 7 here is the rs 48 year old male referred for cough and dyspnea and lung infiltrates he also had symptoms of wheezing and dyspnea off and on over the last one year or so this patient had received four or five courses of saba which did help him with short courses of oral steroids and at least four to five times in the last one year no fever no weight loss no loss of appetite his workup showed a hemogram which was normal no eosinophilia esr was barely raised around 30 no leukocytosis chest x ray and thorax showed patchy infiltrates which had worsened over the last one year and if you looked at this this is august 2011 and then i'm showing you of january 2012 and you can appreciate that there seem to be organizing consolidations particularly getting denser in these areas and I'm, i'll try and show you them on comparative also eventually so this is august 2011 and this is january 2012 i wish we can we had done a bronchoscopic biopsy and we probably would have hit the diagnosis all the same that would not have been much of a different uh, final diagnosis but we did not do that we decided to do a thoracoscopic lung biopsy because we were thinking of a cryptogenic organizing pneumonia at that point in time so i we opted for it and we were thinking of cryptogenic organizing pneumonia abp would would have been a possibility that was ruled out this was probably not hypersensitivity or chostros that was also ruled out so thoracoscopic biopsy was done intercostal drain inserted for air and blood as usual second post operative day was a little funny because there was a 200 cc purulent drain which increased to 350 cc on day 4 and that was a bit of a surprise because none of our lung biopsies ever had a purulent drain clinically very stable patient and the biopsy was a surprise because that was loaded with abs and and those abs were visible so this was tubercular pneumonia many ab seen and this possibly was superimposed on that asthma plus minus going off and on and the lung infiltrates increased where we started misinterpreting them as uh, 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 something else cop it was tubercular process because the patient did not have the classical story of tuberculosis no weight loss no a fever which is chronic evening rise none of that so you could still get a red herring with tuberculosis and tubercular pneumonia would be a differential in something like this so once in a while in ruling out an infection is an important part of our for them at all times uh we move on to another case which is very interesting 45 year old male college teacher progressive dyspnea chest x ray showing interstitial infiltrates this person with this x ray and with a severely uh, restrictive disease with reduced dlco uh he had the lesions which very much were looking ground glass dominant lesions and if you look carefully yes we were looking at lesions where there was a certain amount of subpleural sparing suggestive of an nsip uh this particular finding i realized only later at that point in time when i take took this picture this was i think 14 or 15 years back and i this was our first thoracoscopic lung biopsy and uh, we 
predominant ground glass attenuation minimal basal honeycombing i would now describe it as microcystic honeycombing and not the typical multi layered macrocystic honeycombing which you see in uip this was a biopsy case which was a completely justifiable biopsy dominant ground glass with the uh, you know extend more than the reticular abnormality and his histopathology was nsip fibrotic variety and and for an nsip fibrotic variety he did well he really lived for about 10 years after that he got avascular fake necrosis of femur because of the steroids that we had done and the simple take home here is we have to choose the right patient for a lung biopsy now this gentleman had selected out because this was my first biopsy he had heard that i am capable of it he was willing to give us a consent including a consent of a high risk consent because he knew that i am not i have not done any before and still we we were able to start that entire process of the rachoscopic lung biopsies because of this particular individual so uh, if if a person is explained to him properly and he accept a bi biopsy in certain situations biopsy is very rewarding because this particular person would not have been otherwise on correct therapy for a long enough time i come to the case number 9 here is a 45 year old male presented with exertion related dyspnea and cough over the last 6 months no fever no weight loss now this is his radiology and if you look at it you can't realistically put it into a perfect perspective except the fact that yes the lesions have an apico basal gradient there is no doubt about it there it's difficult to figure out how much of it is ground glassing how much of it is consolidation and is there an honeycombing in this part is in some of these areas there seems to be more consolidation if at all i have to commit on it but i do see certain areas which are a little ground uh, no honeycombed as well now his biopsy was done which was again a thoracoscopic lung biopsy for a 45 year old with this kind of a picture we were uh, able to uh, get a proper diagnosis and the initial diagnosis given by my histopathologist was that this is a cryptogenic organizing pneumonia and we would have accepted that diagnosis without much of a problem uh, looking at the radiology again but uh this was also reviewed by dr andrew churg in uh, vancouver canada for our ild uh, conference and then he picked up something uh, in addition to the organizing pneumonia part of it that there were so many eosinophils here so it was a chronic eosinophilic pneumonia which you can appreciate he has put those pointers everywhere so all those eosinophils are the ones which are responsible for the presentation which is looking like a cryptogenic organizing pneumonia the therapy and the prognosis are slightly different not all that different this patient is doing brilliant on steroids alone and then eventually a immunosuppressive agent to spare him of the steroids but he has maintained it lung function over the last 3 years or so so to conclude a few take homes which i would like to give in this situation the first is of course do not forget whether the person is immunocompetent or immunocompromised the history of an exposure to an antigen is critical and you might have to break your head over it sometimes even visit a patient's home in order to know what is there is there a mold there have to ask it repeatedly are there exposures which they are hidden what kind of hobbies they have i have learned it the hard way in this particular case but then at the same time in the next cases of course i have been doing a better little bit better job dryness with ild is it jaw grains you know if i see too much dryness and in the history that point comes out is it a jaw grains primary jaw grains secondary jaw grains also but primary jaw grains picking up is unusual tubercul uh, transbronchial lung biopsies often a good enough procedure in the cases that we have seen we have seen one miliary there sarcoidosis again a tblb would be a good enough even a endobronchial biopsy or an epus tbn would be good enough many a times hypersensitivity pneumonia you get adequate information on the fact that there is an inflammatory disease process and there are ill defined histocytic granulomas so that might be enough some cops cryptogenic organizing pneumonias and chronic eosinophilic pneumonias would be uh, uh, picked up the mdd is a 
critical and a follow up both are critically important we have to keep on discussing with our pathologist and our pathologists also have become proactive over a period of time so they said sir please just give me more history they will come to us they will want to look at the cities we have whatsapp groups where we keep sharing it and we have formal and informal mdd going on at all times and therefore the clinical acumen of the entire team has kept on progressing upwards tuberculosis is not the last diagnosis in lung nodules and diligent follow up is important because that case where we were showing lung nodules they turned out eventually to be a anca associated vasculitis plus minus an autoimmune disorder so that was that was the message that it is not the only diagnosis but at the same time in the next case which i showed you tuberculosis remains the greatest mimic of them all in this particular case it was mimicking cryptogenic organizing pneumonia nsip an organizing pneumonia or an indeterminate pattern on uip are all clear indications for lung biopsy i would biopsy or at least advise biopsy to all of them of course make sure that you don't biopsy a hypoxic patient who is already on oxygen that would be a high risk thing surely try to don't don't try to do that kind of a surgical lung biopsy on ventilators because there the prognosis becomes worse and worse and worse But earlier the in the game you do it that would be a, a very good idea and of course with the fleshner white paper and the new thing which are coming up a possible probable by the uip and an elderly person could be deferred for a biopsy follow up with antifibrotics and see whether he is evolving into a proper full blue uh, true blue uip in that case you could be obviously avoiding biopsies so with that i think i have taken you through this journey of history to a biopsy and a lot of things which are in between and then i as as you have seen i have gone back and forth i have used my multidisciplinary discussion and i've also used so many other things which are there in our apamentarium and keeping the diagnosis open in certain cases for a long enough time has helped us in actually getting a final diagnosis so with that thank you for your patient listening thank you good evening everyone i will be discussing about the treatment of uh, interstitial lung disease it's a huge topic and there are 200 ilds and we need to churn out ipf out of these ilds because the treatment of ipf is totally different than non ipf i will just give a overview how exactly we go about from the avoidance to a lung transplantation coming to the avoidance once you diagnose the disease of ild in spite of uh, uh, we don't know the cause in idiopathic ilds there might be some causes which we don't know and uh, these based on the historical finding and occupational history and uh, important risk factors seems to be smoking and there are smoking associated with ilds also and smoking cessation becomes important in prevention of developments of ild especially there are certain ilds which are smoking related and in general smoking cessation is also good and we can use quit smoking clinic drugs certain like nitrofurantoin and amiodarone which are Uh, used chronically and we don't even know sometimes we cause lung injury and that should be avoided certain environmental and occupational risk factor especially asbestos or silicosis and coal workers pneumoconiosis and certain environmental risk factors like farmers lung and other things they can cause ild and i avoided exposure to pigeons has to be prevented that over trivial because that's the thing where we get organic dust exposure and any other organic Uh, dust exposure can also lead to uh, hp and hp is a one differential diagnosis in indian registry that will be mimicking like uip and that should be taken into consideration when you tell about avoidance measures and steroid responsiveness is a key in dia- in the treatment of ild especially in the non ipf ild they variably respond with steroids at to some extent some are ex- absolutely reversible and some they halt the progression of the disease which responds to steroids are most probably granulomatous or ILDs like sarcoidosis and hypersensitivity monitors in early stages and later this organizing pneumonia and drug induced ILD in spite of stopping inciting agent you need a steroids and connective tissue disorders already we know that steroids helps and sometimes they can be switched over and to a DMRD later and certain drug induced and inorganic dust acute conditions we use steroids that's the key and role of steroid in IPF I will talk so there is definitely no role of steroids in a stable ipf 
and in acute exacerbation yes we do high dose steroids with the broad spectrum antibiotics because we don't have a choice and uh, sometimes we use inhaled steroids especially if it's obstruct uh, obstructive airway disease or a pre existing asthma we use inhaled steroid and the group d of copds we use inhaled steroid if it is a cpfe combined pulmonary fibrosis and ild specific therapy anti fibrotics i will discuss later because that helps the progression of the disease in terms of steroids in non ipf we use uh, there's no optimal dose actually what we use in a chronic disease in the non ipf setting we use a particular regimen where you start with 0.1 0.5 mg per kg body weight usually it is given to 6 weeks to 12 weeks and 12 weeks is reasonable response can be assessed and if it's really responding we reduce to 50% and later to 25% and continue with a chronic maintenance dose if it's really responding especially it happens in sarcoidosis so sometimes you can taper off and stop if it is totally reversed and sometimes if it is not improving much and there's there are steroid induced side effect we add a second agent usually it is immunosuppressants sometimes rapid tapering can cause recurrences that's the way in general we use the steroids and there are different method which short course steroids we use it for a cough and sometimes we use it uh, uh, if there is a limitations we use it shorter doses or uh, minimal doses coming to a, a second next variety of apart from ipf in a non ipf is a nsip and it is a radiological variant we see a ground glass appearance in early stages cellular and late stages it's fibrotic and fibrotic stages in the later stages it's behaving like a fibrosing ild more like ipf but it's much longer and usually there will be underlying uh, disease like ctd drug induced and hypersensitive pneumonitis they should be treated 20% are idiopathic nsips they usually uh, they don't respond in spite of the treatment we use steroids and immunosuppressants at early stages but later there is an emerging role that anti fibrotics can help in this condition next condition is a boob and boob is a bronchiolitis obliterans with organizing pneumonia most commonly it is post pneumonic complications the fever is not settling in spite of treatment sometimes ct will pick up pneumonia like finding and there is no response to treatment we need to do the apsis and that is been explained and nobody knows the correct doses sometimes we use a pulse dose steroid or a regular dose and switch over to around 20 to 40 mg of steroids we taper over a period of time at least it requires long term or 3 months to 6 months sometimes it can just halt sometimes they require a long term maintenance therapy at least 6 months to 1 1 and half years it might improve and that's way about uh, boob sometimes if you don't know the cause what is the etiology that triggered the boob it might be a malignancy to many reasons and it's called idiopathic boob or cough coming to acute this is life threatening acute interstitial pneumonia this is a life threatening uh, failure using invasive mechanical ventilation you can't sometimes diagnose it uh, when they are leaving sometimes it's post mortem finding with available tools you can diagnose acute interstitial pneumonia with a biopsy is not clear role of steroids is there however we use pulse dose steroid like acute exacerbation of I, ipf and sometimes you know suppressants like cyclophosphamide and mortality is very high up to 60% it's a subset of idiopathic ards smoking related ilt apart from these two uh, discomative interstitial pneumonia and respiratory bronchiolitis associated ilds we have histocytosis x and that also usually it responds by just stopping smoking alone sometimes they may require steroid right? there is no much clear role and the way we see it's the reduced ground glass appearance the only thing is in respiratory bronchiolitis ild it behaves like copd and more of small airway obstruction we need additional inhaler or a bronchodilator or a macrolides they really help acute interstitial lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia it is been taken out of the newer guidelines and it is in a separate subset with from afop and these are variants of that and it is a manifestation of underlying disease like hiv and jogren's disease and senior pediatric age group also usually they respond with the steroids and immunosuppressant and the ct shows some kind of cyst and it can be a differential diagnosis for the cyst like lam and other conditions and coming to these non ipf ilds we need immunosuppressants as a drug of choice and i will not talking depth about this i will just tell all the concepts behind it rituximab and tacrolimus we don't have much experience usually in a nephrologist in a post transplant setting or sometimes any pulmonary renal syndrome we can use rituximab and tacrolimus serolimus yes if uh, a lam is a condition where serolimus is recommended as a new finding and that can be and we should know about more about this of course there are side effect we need to monitor serolimus is a treatment of choice for lam that is a specific therapy all other drugs are used as a connective tissue disorder ilds usually and uh, we know methotrexate is useful in rheumatoid and overlap diseases of rheumatoid arthritis methotrexate is good in spite of certain methotrexate induced ilds it's much safer and most cost effective in uh, scleroderma ild it is cyclophosphamide and there is a new evidence that even anintin and it can help uh, in this uh, scleroderma ild if it is a uip pattern or nsip pattern it can be presented use azathioprine it's a usual drug and it has to be monitored with cbc and lft and uh, sometimes there is a risk of 
opportunistic infection like herpes and all we should be careful and new kid in the block is mycofungal etmofetil which is we use up to 2 to 3 grams of medicine and sometimes gi side effects are a limiting factor and it is pretty good it can be used in a long term and we can taper off the steroids and give it for a long term especially like nsip and this thing this kind of condition where the disease requires a long term treatment so coming to antifibrotic this is mainly for ipf so we know that antifibrotic the disease the way the ipf behaves it's not inflammatory disease it's more of fibrotic disease and it uh, um, decreases the collagen synthesis where it forms helps in the formation of fibrosis and it doesn't give a symptom relief or cure it just slows the progression of the disease and can decrease the number of exacerbation that's the key and the dosage initially the pill burden was to be high in 200 mg now it's 400 mg and 600 mg is available we can go up to 2400 sometimes tolerability limits it at 1800 is good enough and we start to lower dose and go up to the higher dose and we monitor lft monthly initially and later on since three months it's pretty safe drug and side effects limits it usually gastritis and sometimes can cause photosensitivity reactions if they take the drug and go outside within one hour of outside and this is the limiting factor of perfenadol and it's cost effective then comes to an intinib which is new thing after 2 to 3 years it's, it's there in triple of tyrosine blockade it prevents the uh, synthesis of fibro fibrogens and fibroblast and which have and pdgf growth factor it's a triple kinase inhibitor it also reduces the process the progression of the disease and no symptom relief and first time to get an exacerbation on this thing can be delayed with this drug and usually it used in 100 and 150 mg twice daily and even lft monitoring is required it causes loose motions and sometimes side effects or hepatotoxicity and uh, there's no much uh, to difference between perfenadone and nitinib and uh, the cost is a limiting factor for nitinib and the cost of medicine but tolerability and pill burden is less and sometimes they are suggesting the combination can come in the future advanced disease It's normally antifibrotics are not used because of the disease is progressed and uh, but there is a debate that nitinib can be used in advanced disease what i mean is the dlc is less than 35% and require evidence of rv dysfunction and eh where there is more tone of arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death sometimes sild enough way if there is no ischemic heart disease can be used but there is no evidence to support any ph lower in drug because it worsens the vq mismatch which has already matched and precipitate hypoxia more in the borderline patients and we should be careful when we use it and that subset of patients who require anticoagulant if they have a pulmonary embolism otherwise there's no need of anticoagulant over a long term long long period of time as per n style system like a panther ipf trial was used in combination monotherapy is not advised few subset of patients it might be helpful but there's no way to detect which are those subset and it's treats a genetic testing and with other therapies sometimes you use it for short term to make the secretions and if there is a bronchitis some secretions it helps and patients feel better we give it for a short duration of the time apart from all uh, this thing supportive treatment for in general for all ild we need a good educative uh, tools to explain about ild it is progressive disease sometimes it might reverse and sudden worsening can actually harm so if they know about the disease you have to give a handout and explain them about it, especially which is progressive disease sometimes we have to tell about monitoring of oxygen even if they are well and it helps us and whenever they really worsen and they may require a pulse oximeter monitor sometimes they may require ambulatory oxygen and 3 to 5 liters up to 9 liters can be given in a home and they are bed bound or sometimes those kind of patients they give a long term home oxygen therapy with monitoring of pulse oximeter they are terminally ill they may require high frequency um high flow oxygen like they use in just just spice the time and uh, without resorting to a invasive mechanical ventilator you can give up to 100% to 100% of uh, fio2 and vaccination as in general pneumococcal both conjugate and polysaccharide vaccine can be given and it's good protection for pneumonia at least 50% and influenza every year probably covid might come in future and that might also be advised and uh, pulmonary rehab and there's no clear cut uh, this thing in only in the studies of ild but this can be extrapolated from copd the pulmonary rehab and their fitness level is good and all they may last longer and their strength uh, this thing their uh, respiratory failure that their endurance that matters pulmonary reha- uh, rehabilitation definitely helps because the medications what they are just delay the progression of the disease coming to the comorbidities treatment of ipf is always important usually this is cardiac and uh, cardiac up to angioplasty is okay and bypass and all is going to be very tough and pulmonary hypertension dvt since they are bed bound they are more risk of dvt and pulmonary embolism and most common time 90% it's associated with grd we need uh, ga- um, ppis uh, proton pump inhibitor sometimes 
done a study with rapid care trial where they have done a laparoscopic surgery for reflux surgery also and it has helped chronic aspiration is one of the risk factor for development of ipf fibrosis is a risk factor for cancer also there are associated emphysema has to be treated with inhalers properly diabetes nutrition because you are not using much of steroid in ipf sometimes diabetes Uh, can worsen and they are prone for infections and nutrition helps depression because since they are dependent on oxygen bed bound it is going to be very tough and associated ovation even if it is tough to diagnose sometimes osa by treating osa they can live longer and they can use sudden cardiac death can be prevented and osteoporosis we should be careful in monitoring with vitamin d and bone mineral densities and uh, give adequate bisphosphonates and calcium supplements especially when we are using the steroids uh, in non ipfs palliative care sometimes they are not affordable and the longevity is less and life expectancy is uh, very less that time uh, individual preferences beliefs not going on a ventilator all those things are very very important and discussion with family members end of life care issues has to be discussed sometimes palliation uh, works wonders especially in 70 75 years and smoothens the family and the tender they can go smoothly and when they are dying they have have a dignified death advanced directives are important and the palliative care physicians are required uh, uh, during the terminal stages and they can die in the hospital also sometimes we advise them to be at home and have a tender loving care hold their hands and hospice care is provided and this should be offered in the early stage for all ipf patients uh, as far as lung transplant is concerned the timing of referral so first diagnosis of uip and with these evidences of uh, vital capacity dlco and functional limitation or saturation why they should be referred first to just to know that there is a transplantation available uh, listing is totally different if they have a uh, drop of uh, fe1 more than 10% in 3 to 6 months because that delays so that that delay has to occur and dlco drops more than 15% in 6 months that's a pft criteria where they have to get listed 6 minute walk test if there is a a uh, sudden drop in walking distance or 20 40 50% 50 meters decline is there or saturation drops on exercise then these are the patients who need to be listed for transplant and pulmonary hypertension hospitalization for any reasons like yeah, pneumothorax or active, that's the time uh, you need to list the patient for transplant and uh, survival rate is good single lung transplant is a standard but there are some problems of infection and reperfusion injuries bilateral is better but it's very tough and but that's preferred sometimes living donor if they are going to die very fast and if you get an option there is nothing like that the complications are usually bronchiolitis obliterans i will not go deep into that and this is the way we go about in treating the ilds in general so usually if there is a transplant option mortality risk is high we refer to to the diagnosis pharmacological treatment it's a specific treatment we give them symptom control will not do much about it because it's not like a bronchodilation which is achieved symptoms we can endure them and do them uh, oxygen pulmonary rehabilitation that really helps ask them to adjust with their dyspnea and their exercise capacity treat the comorbidities like gid and pulmonary hypertension there some controversies of giving a ph lower drugs lowering drug it's not approved but we are careful if there is a disproportionate hypertension you can give and monthly three monthly or six monthly review regular pfds acute exacerbation managements with antibiotics steroids and anticoagulants as dbt prophylaxis sometimes bed bone and if they have arrhythmia regulation sometimes if it is progressive ild or progressive ild and uh, dnr addition ventilation they should not because it's reversible sometimes it's better not to offer them invasive ventilation palliative care and advanced directive and if you get an opportunity and they can afford and you have a center access to that better defer, refer to our transplant physicians thank you very much thank you sir we are live sir we are live hi hello so that was one of the marvelous uh, speeches on this topic ild i have seen and i have witnessed and as usual dr nitin abhyankar sir you were like uh, you the the presentation the the uh, the ct scans biopsies everything was gem like it it is an eye opening experience for all of us and uh, dr hinappa as always like uh, the the content was so so sharp and precise the the treatment guidelines everything you have followed and in so much of less time you have covered everything i'm i'm amazed like this is this is one of the best uh, 
presentations i have come across so far so uh, thanks for for being so kind i think we are we are trying to fit it in time but you know well i mean <laughs> but but it it has been a marvelous uh, experience i think audience must enjoy doing it in. as much and i hope there are a lot of questions so now yes, you sir. Sir, you to let on are, yes sir the questions are uh, first of all as your domain uh, lung biopsy dr dev singh jangapangi and he is uh, asking about his mention like uh, lung biopsy when do you consider lung biopsy in addition to this question there's the one more question from uh, audience like like precisely when do you decide when to go tblb when to go thoracoscopic biopsy when to go cryo biopsy like do you have set criteria like when to yeah. choose Uh, yeah. among the armor team we are having see, see i'll tell you it's a very very nice question and it is one question which has actually haunted everybody all over the world for a long time and in fact if you really see people went right up to a surgical biopsy then bats biopsy and then now people are going back to a bal all over again because bal alone can sort so many questions so the question is can my diagnosis be confirmed with that given intervention it doesn't have to be even a biopsy it could be a bal and certain markers or combination of markers which is giving you all the information that you are looking at so i think one has to be realistic in your given setup what is the most appropriate thing which reaches the diagnosis closest to reality for example for an hypersensitivity pneumonia a transbronchial lung biopsy could be good enough for a cryptogenic organ organizing pneumonia when the in the from the right area you can document good enough amount of material which is blocking the bronchioles and and the plugs and and that would be good enough but when we are looking at an architecture diagnosis for example typically nsip if i am looking at that or if i am looking at a possible probable uip and i am not sure it's a young person and i don't want i don't want to take a chance of just exposing somebody to steroids for the sake of it younger people people with a normal oxygenation people who are really desperately needing the diagnosis and of course somebody who is progressing so you can't of course i mean somebody who is sarcoid has absolutely no symptoms we can go without a biopsy at, at all and watch whereas somebody who is progressive young and needs a desperate diagnosis and you are going to be confused between whether i am going on to the fibrotic pathway or and i am going to the inflammatory pathway and when i really really have that question that question needs to be answered by an appropriate biopsy now appropriate biopsy starts with transbronchial lung biopsy can move to cryo biopsy depending on what your setup is doing can go to a medical thoracoscopic lung biopsy in my kind of a setup or can go to a vats biopsy depending on whether you are having it and whether your patient can afford it as a diagnostic procedure mind you you have to treat an ild for his life after that so you can't beg make him bankrupt with one vats and that's the end of it so if you really look at me i look at it philosophically looking at it i am a middle class patient's middle class doctor so i deal with a biopsy which is somewhere in middle and it is neither vats nor nor is it tblb uh, or no biopsy either so i i i try to fit it to my patient's budget they tend to accept it they they are able to afford that they are able to even afford the complications of it if something happens and goes wrong and then you know it makes realistic to go for a biopsy which is relevant to your scenario your setup and most importantly you can't be doing experimental work in this domain because no biopsy is free from its danger so one has to be very careful in advising advocating biopsy very strongly particularly be sure that you are not dealing with hypoxemic patients you are not dealing with people who are advanced disease somebody on non invasive ventilation something of that sort should not be subjected to a biopsy as far as possible unless until once you are in uh, on a very very desperate turf so except desperate situations we would not be recommending that the other thing worth remembering is any interstitial uh, any connective tissue disorder usually will not require a biopsy unless until you have a very big diagnostic question pending there so i think these two caveats if you remember mostly you will be done and as i as i've shown you infections will keep surprising you so if whatever else you do the infections will be there and do not underestimate so at least putting in a bronchoscope and doing a bal could be a minimum that may be required in a substantial number of patient i'm not saying all a substantial number of patient it may be worthwhile because you are going to put them on either steroids or immunosuppression later on i hope that partly takes care of this question sir as uh, i can say like uh, from starting to you know uh, covering all the aspect uh, the 
the answer must have satisfied and you know quenched the thirst of many uh, unsolved questions uh, now i'll be taking the second question it is from dr samina to dr nitin and uh, she uh, is asking can miliary tb mimic hp i i think she may be meaning from the clinical and uh, histopathological uh, or uh, maybe uh, uh, um, uh, radiological backgrounds as we can see granuloma or something so i would like to ask dr nitin from the investigative parts like uh, can it be possible i i have hypothesized this in my mind because number of times we do have a coexistent disease for example like what it happened in this patient there was tb there was a gene expert documented tb patient got partially better the curve got regressed but then the, those nodules started you know they, if you see the follow up scan they started cavitating and that was a hint towards a vasculitis actually that is when we started thinking so we were idiots initially not to do all that and we had that a lymphoplasmocytoid kind of a uh, infiltrate once in a while a hypersensitivity pneumonia to a tubercular antigen also has been hypothesized but we do not have enough data to talk about this entity as a genuine entity so i would rather say concomitant rather than caused by each other or and mimics yes but cause effect relationship we can't extrapolate at this point in time so i think whenever i am finding tb i will treat tb as a separate entity i'll try to do justice to that fully well because there are immune suppressions uh, in certain diseases which are going to come uh, ahead and ongoing possibly so one has to be careful with tb but uh, and can it mimic i would rather say yes ki tb does keep confusing our diagnostic scenario time and again and you do, do have a surprise diagnosis of tuberculosis the worst i can remember is a patient with a smoker with a right upper lobe lung nodule which we operated that was malignancy squamous cell there were seven nodes surrounding it all seven nodes had a tuberculosis in it so well i mean so i am not going to discount the idea that tuberculosis should not be looked for it should be looked for but it, these are not classical features of tuberculosis obviously as i remember my uh, all the teachers has said tb can present as anything <laughs> so we always have to keep in our mind the background uh, like it can be coexistent or it can be uh, like alone diagnosis so we have to one question for dr nitin from dr uh, mani maran uh, in one case you mentioned purulent secretion post case, post icd in tb ild yeah it didn't show any plural connection so you want to uh, know like uh, uh, what like develop later uh, uh, or yeah in fact you know we 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 get horrified when i get a purulent secretion after a bronchial thoracoscopy that means i have done something really bad isn't it i have infected this particular patient so that was the scare that we had the purulent secretion was essentially because of a tubercular process and that was a marker of it which eventually got verified but at the same time when we first saw pus i said man what have i done here because <laughs> i have infected this person i have taken him for an elective biopsy and you are here you are you are having a having a purulent secretion coming and i am now to load him with an antibiotic in fact we gave him two days of antibiotic before it became obvious to us that this was tubercular process which was causing the pus through the plural wherever we had made holes because it was the disease if you really notice sufficient amount of it was subplural and the other thing which i kept on uh, asking myself why did i do it in the first place because i could have done a transbronchial lung biopsy and a bal and i would have got it but we did not suspect it in fact why yeah. you are muted why you are muted yourself hello can i you have muted you yeah yeah i'm yeah. Not, fine so uh, one question uh, to dr hinappa uh, from dr kunal is there any role of bronchodilator in ild i think very interesting question must say because as we see the prescription of ild and as we see the bronchodilators mentioned we hit upon oh my god what this doctor has done uh, i would like to know the indications of bronchodilator in cases of interstitial lung disease uh, see in practice uh, in a guidelines interstitial lung disease if it is a pure interstitial lung disease it's a parenchymal disease and you can have some small airway uh, disease because of the parenchymal process you can have a distal small airway bronchiolitis traction bronchiectasis and all but that may behave as a small airway disease and sometimes there are new drugs which have come as bronchodilatation which can reach the small airway in that way for a symptomatic relief 
you can give but if there is an obstruction and all if there is no symptom relief because uh, whatever the drugs we give for parenchymal disease they will not give a symptomatic relief and most of the patients in practice what we see and i suggest in a guideline that bronchodilators are required most of the patients who are treated and they have gone for other uh, uh, doctors and all they will be on a nebulization of uh, some kind of bronchodilator always so as a recommendation you bronchodilation is not required but if there is associated asthma you are a pre existing asthma from 40 to 50 and you develop id later you might require a bronchodilation steroids and sometimes cpf free and smoker is a risk factor for both and we have a obstructive airway disease and we see a dlco and emphysema these kind of changes you can add additional bronchodilators without any steroid if it is copd if it is a disease sometimes it is very difficult to stage get into a grade a grade b like that but if if they give a relief if after treating the ild per se and if you feel that there is additional vees or anything like that clinically or if you see that additional component of emphysema you can add a bronchodilator but uh, as such terminally ill patients sometimes for a symptomatic relief for the war of uh, for the want of patients something we have to offer and uh, we just have a habit of adding a nebulization for any lung disease and that should not be practiced as such it's not a good practice uh in my views like i have seen uh, cases like where the uh, if the pft is showing bronchodilator reversibility like in case mm-hmm. of sarcoidosis uh, some somewhere True. somewhere air, airway obstruction is present then we can be justified but giving Just. bronchodilators to i really would not be suffiable uh, true 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 i agree yes sir. i agree with that because even sarcoidosis is a airway disease and uh, sometimes they say sarcoidosis that doesn't require only observations we don't even see in the parenchymal disease but still the airway can be involved and uh, inhaled steroid and uh, uh, those things are given even a bron- inhaled inhalers are given in sarcoidosis just to avoid oral steroids and to tide over causes it may behave like uh, obstructive airway disease that is been seen in sarcoidosis especially as ild because it's airway lymph nodal parenchymal disease so ipf as such it is pure parenchymal disease the airway involvement is small airway and it is secondary to the parenchymal destruction destruction uh, so when can i add something here because yes, this sure, one sir. entity uh, he has very rightly pointed out you know apart from cpf there is not much role for a bronchodilator this is very True. right about it one entity where i have you know one way or other the other been flirting with it is chronic obliterative bronchiolitis And I agree. One, I agree. Once so, one entity where you know whatever you do is non-scientific in any case. So you add, as well may give bronchodilators because because if you give steroids, you don't know whether they are working. If you give immunosuppression, maybe you do are not sure whether it is working. So, if it is diffuse pen bronchiolitis, you have a direct treatment in the terms of clarithromycin. But otherwise, you do not have direct approved kind of a therapy. And there, I I do indulge into bronchodilators yeah, as well as maybe inhaled corticosteroids. Sorry, especially if it is a RBILD like picture I have mentioned it in the slide, where uh, it is slightly different, where the small airways are also involved, uh, and it yes. behaves like more of inspiratory and expiratory yes. hypersensitivity pneumonitis. They have some amount of small airway obstruction. Sometimes it's not uh, wrong. We get tweaks on examination and all, so it's not wrong to use a newer bronchodilator therapy with our. Uh, in a micron size which is less than 2 mm they can reach a small airway and they can give a good relief and instead of uh, putting them on a oral steroid which you are not beneficial people don't want to take and they really add it and see for a week or so four to six weeks and see if they are really doing well and it adds benefit means uh, why not especially in rbild associated cpfe pre existing obstructive airway disease and sometimes traction bronchiectasis like secretions and we need a bronchodilation we can add Absolutely. and of course try and document as best as we can try and document benefit or reversibility preferably yes, of course yes. now in the covid times your lung functions you are going to go out of the window yes, so i think it's going to be one big hell of a i have bad year ahead of it uh, us, all of us so i think that is one entity which will go down and you'll have to depend more and more on your clinical acumen so uh, as we say about covid this question uh, from dr tridip chatterji Uh, so he is asking whether we have data on covid corats uh, five or six can cause uh, fibrosing ild in future or any like uh, what what would be like uh, the future of covid related ild if any speculation or any any data from anywhere like uh, till now or we are still progress uh, so i think right now we are speculating let us let us all believe because the, the, the epidemic is so young that we we haven't seen but you know if you really ask me i would rather compare it with the previous epidemic and h1n1 i have seen h1n1 ards going on for two months and then landing up into a total respiratory cripple 
and that kind of a you know fibrotic ild which was left behind after a bad h1n1 is typically not being seen here in this particular entity those who recover they seem to be recovering completely in fact one of my hypersensitivity pneumonias went on to getting a covid went on to a bit of a cytokine storm came out and he has gone back to his old exact doses of mycophenolate and steroids which was all that he was on and he's he's a chronic respiratory cripple in the in one sense but he is not worsened further if you really see the lung involvement seems i'm not I, i'm i'm no final answer on this years will tell us time will tell us but lung involvement seems to be transient it is obviously dominated by ground glassing and therefore i'm assuming it is more reversible as compared to h1 in what related ards and the subsequent fibrosis and the other component of it is most of the people who are actually landing into ards like scenario are not making it so very few for a few survivors coming out of it whereas in a h1 in an ards we would say 50% of them were surviving here we are saying 10% of them are surviving so i think we'll have a much smaller sub segment of respiratory cripples left over that is what my my gut gut feeling at this point in time is i think that we have to wait for the real life data on this thanks sir so uh, uh, i would like to ask like uh, some change of topic uh, like i have to say connective tissue disorder related ild so uh, the question from dr tarun also that what is like uh, what what we see different type of nlis uh, iif ifa what uh, two question uh, a question is to dr nitin sir what do you choose amongst the various uh, na options available the choice of uh, test and second thing then how to, if na is positive what pattern you see like then uh, go ahead adding further like uh, speckle cytoplasm we see very variety of pattern what dilution so to take it uh, i am also a learner in this and very frankly i learn from my rheumatology friends i have been excellently backed up by rheumatologists all the time so i have continuously co-worked with them so very frankly for a, for a for a long number of years i wouldn't understand that cytoplasmic is not important today i know that if i am having an ana which is 1 in 100 or something like 1 in 64 and cytoplasmic may not be but nuclear or, or the uh, other variant is significant so even if it is in low titers it will be significant cytoplasmic i'll have to go for 1 in 320 and onwards so once that is the one issue of titers and very frankly i am not i am not deciding so mayank if you have a better answer than this please contribute to hiranap also i am more often than not my rheumatologist calls these shots once because i involve him very early in the game and we are we are almost in sync on from day one you know the moment i think autoimmune i have i have i have him on the board and very much he is a part of our mdd so he drives the rest basically so he chooses those entities i would like to add add i would like to add is a uh, two ana if is are negative uh, it is like not related to uh, connective tissue that was the, this thing and there is a component of lung dominant uh, uh, ctd also sometimes we we tend to follow them if there is nsip and they ana ana can come positive at later time of a diet and they can get a extra pulmonary manifestation later date i have seen in my practice another thing when i didn't involve the this thing i used to do that ana is negative and anti ccp ra is negative connective tissue is ruled out it, it was a thinking process for me but when i see a ground glass which was presented like that when a rheumatologist was on board in 3 5 years back and uh, he advised me to send and my habit was sending cpk ana ra and all those things to as a serology workup anti synthetase antibody anti synthetic this is not in the normal component of ana profile when you profile. do the sure. ana test which comes positive this was positive and uh, we were planning for a vats lung biopsy we just avoided and gave a pulse dose steroid it really worked so we need to be very very sure the type of a ct presentation it is like a ground glass ground glass ground glass the component if the patient is not willing for a biopsy and if the component is uh, all the ana ana profile is negative we need to add a cpk in that just to see that uh, myositis is also existing sometimes cpk elevated can clinch the diagnosis okay second thing is looking for other extra pulmonary manifestation sometimes uh, all the ctd signs and sigmatas are negative this anti synthetase antibodies we should have a profile of ctd profile where we can really get into whether serology is totally negative and we are uh, dealing only with the lung lung dominant disease even this can also be ctd but 
you can follow it over a period of time and see other method that time we will end up doing a biopsy in this uh, in these cases and hypersensitivity pneumonitis also adds into the picture and because apart from the history if the pigeon is not there it can be still hypersensitive the classical presentation of a ct even if you dig deep and ask history left and right you are not going to find out a organic dust which is responsible for hypersensitive pneumonitis because once you continue with steroid it is reversible and if they are exposed to a same environment the disease can go become a fibrotic process and behaves like ipf and it goes on irrespective of you add mycophenolate and everything biopsy proven with the transbronchial lung biopsy i am seeing the hps are also bad in late stages and if you don't find a inciting agent so we should really get a panel for hp which is not there particularly what is the real panel somebody has to work in a guidelines what we should get as a panel as hp for an indian scenario and I'll, I'll, I'll go back to the first the, that question on the ana related question and there are a few clinical you know take homes very important ones a young lady non specific interstitial pneumonia pattern you should think that there is an connective tissue there in the background even if your sure. ana is negative and then there are three or four radiological features which are very classical for a ctd related ild one of them is if i see too much of honeycombing it's called as exuberant honeycombing sign so if i see that that is absolutely something if i see anterior segment of the upper lobe involved that is again another sign which is considered important and another another sign is straight edge sign so that means if there is something which is like you know finishing at a particular level and nothing above it then again also ct related in fact that straight edge sign was there in my jogrens actually it is it's a funny thing because it was aip but it was still still having a straight edge sign there so uh, of course i didn't pick it up then but now i know that these are important so if you have these clinical clues which are uh, of course they come from the radiology clues and they they also could take you back to a uh, ana being done in more depths and more details no the, the, uh, these are the things which we learned in mdt and it is adding to us usually the esophageal dilatation the pah or uh, uh, this can add to the clue for for uh, getting the diagnosis totally totally your systemic sclerosis often gets picked up on a ct more than on a biopsy of course you almost never biopsy a uh, systemic true. sclerosis one. yes so even in case like if we see ana and there there is a new uh, like uh, uh, term coming with interstitial pneumonia with autoimmune features so we always even if the ana is positive sometimes ena we stop at ena okay that's okay the <laughs> everything is coming out to be negative but if the if we are suspecting ild and connective tissue related ild to be uh, like a significant cause in, uh, in the patient we have to go further and get the anti synthase antibody and myositis profile done to rule out for anti jo anti sm also sometimes yes happen. sir yes sir so i uh, think you know the i think that message is our work up should not stop and i think i think a referral is very very important at a particular point in time if you start getting you know because our ipf actually is not a clinical entity it is a it is something which is a conglomerate of things where these two things are together there is some form of an ld and there is some flair to it of an autoimmune disease it's not a well or identified autoimmune disease and a pulmonologist alone can't make this diagnosis so so even to come to the conclusion that this is ipf it has to be a joint effort between a rheumatologist and a pulmonary clinician either of them alone should not be making this diagnosis alone sir, sir, i would like to add in this uh, when i uh, i learned with a rheumatology colleague when the ana and everything was uh, negative no uh, and uh, ild and this thing so nail bed capillaroscopy and yeah. uh, nail bed capillaroscopy because there were no signs you know just involving the rheumatologist just nail bed capillaroscopy he said that it is ctd i don't know about ana ana profile yeah. all anti synthetase if yeah. this nail bed capillaroscopy it is ctd okay. it okay. doesn't have to go for a biopsy so, so that, that has that has clinched uh, the diagnosis okay. so there are certain simple things like getting the fundoscopy done looking for uh, certain uh, eye features and that rheumatologist can do much better they pick it up okay. all the Absolutely. nail features then even if you have learned the clinical skills of identifying the ct yeah even even mechanics hands for that matter you know very important and we can sometimes miss them whereas the rheumatologist will not not miss them because he is trained he is trained to look at the whole body and i am not glorifying the rheumatologist Yeah, he has his inadequacies. We have ours, but if we go together, we become a better team. Definitely.
Yeah. So uh, now coming on to the management part, we'll be hurrying up with the question, answers because there's a lot of questions that are still to oh, be sure, answered. Sure, sure. So uh, about the management part, first of all, in the this the continuing discussion with the connective tissue disorder related ILD, first of all, choice of uh, immunosuppressant, if we have to give, we have several other options like, uh, and specific to the diseases, if we can have like rheumatoid arthritis, what immunosuppression will you be preferring? And other related, like we have azathioprine, MMF, so, so much of uh, armatarium. What we prefer in which kind of patient, Dr. Hinnapa and Dr. Nitin, over to you. Huh, uh, see, when you diagnose it as it is CTD, and uh, we have various type of CTD, it will fit under, based on the rheumatology guidelines, it will fit under either RA or seronegative RA, and it might fit under anti uh, CCP positive RAs. You may not get rheumatoid positive RA. Sometimes it might be lung dominant RA also. You don't even have uh, this thing. So we just look at how is the pattern of ANA profile is coming. And we look at it is a scleroderma uh, related ILD. So we, we just get into a specific disease pattern. So if you really look at a scleroderma related ILD. So we, we have a lot of ample evidence that uh, monthly dose of cyclophosphamide is better. And since the toxicities and other things are because daily dose of cyclophosphamide is not good, they use the steroid at lower dose because scleroderma, uh, when they use at higher more than 20 mg, they can precipitate steroderma renal crisis. This is the condition, you know that steroids are indicated, but the safety of using the steroid, you know, you know this can be used. It, it can be used and how it should be used, it's important. Steroderma, you start with low dose steroid and give more immunosuppressant, which will collect. So based on that, the CT and every picture, we decide if it's scleroderma, we choose that. So if it is rheumatoid and the overlap between a rheumatoid arthritis and other things, methotrexate, even if they say it is methotrexate induced ILD, it's most cost effective and time tested and more than 20 years old. And it is a beautiful drug. So you should not worry about a methotrexate uh, induced ILD. And most of the rheumatologists feel it's safe after getting this thing. We need to prove methotrexate ILD is very tough. Most of the time it will be something else. So if it is there, we they still re-challenge and methotrexate is a good drug. And they can add HCQS in that if at all they have some skin finding and other things. So they can add, uh, even the HQS is a lot of talk, uh, talked about. No, I'm not going to talk about. It has taken a ride for us. And if you come to the connective tissue disorders of other things, like if azathioprine is a time-tested drug, in especially vasculitis associated, vaginous, and these kind of vaginous nanometer, it is also 50 mg to 100 mg to 150 mg. And we have a good experience. We can use that and we can monitor it still cost effective monitoring the drug, if those the limitations or side effects happen, then we choose other drugs. Sometimes uh, rituximab is the one thing which we choose. And if you don't have much of experience of using uh, rituximab, I also don't have, which our nephrology colleague and rheumatologist, they use in a non-responding connective tissue. We can keep that at that end. Tacrolimus as such is a post-renal transplant drug. I am not used uh, in terms of a CTD related uh, uh, this thing. But when it comes to steroidness, I studied a lot and I asked with the nephrology colleagues, especially for a lamb. Lamb usually comes as a um, clear cut radiological presentation with cysts and other things. Usually it is like a, a differential diagnosis or you know, it is like a um, pointer. You say that CT, they show it is lamb. But nowadays I did the biopsy because there are future options of lung transplant are there and there are future treatment which are awaited. Earlier it was wait and watch and progressive disease. Now we did a biopsy on a bad lung biopsy and we sent the diagnostic we need to uh, monitor the VEGF levels also. And there is a treatment available means we need to biopsy. We biopsied it and we started using serolimus. And earlier if deterioration used to add, now the recommendation in 2019-20 is there. At first instance of diagnosis of LAM, we have to start serolimus. So I will come last, at last to mycophenolate mofetil. And this is this has made our life easy and uh, and most of the time uh, rheumatologist we used to send and we are afraid that the patient will be taken away and they don't know about much of hypoxia and they go when they are terminally ill we try to follow them and most of the time our headache of solving that palliative care and all it needs a lot of discussion so when we had uh, specifically when you learn from rheumatology colleagues and mycophenolate is very safe drug up to two to three grams of mycophenolate can be used and only limiting factor is the cost and it comes in a different dosage, 360 and all. GI side effects are the problem. But mycophenolate I have used in sarcoidosis. Mycophenolate I have used in some kind of uh, things which are ILD, NSIPs also. And uh, even for hypersensitive pneumonitis uh, at a late stages, I have used a mycophenolate. 
and for mycophenolate use pulmonologists are coming forward and in terms of rheumatology colleagues uh, scleroderma ILDs scleroderma ILDs they say the recommendation is an anti fibrotic drug like lentinib maybe rheumatologists may start using that more and that is been been approved now and idiopathic nsips if you don't have the cause and uh, these chronic fibrosing ILDs progressive fibrosing ILD apart from ipf ild we have a role of nintenanib this thing that's how i choose immunosuppressant on a whole seeing the disease pattern and uh, we use pulse dose steroid only if they are very very sick which is life threatening and then take it uh, uh, to the immunosuppressant and we tra the transition from steroids to immunosuppressants it's the art of treating or a follow up so that was and That's one word of uh, mayank one one word of caution on that uh, i'm 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 also i was very very fond of azathioprine for a very long time and particularly in chronic hp fibrotic hp our usage of azathioprine was so much that i have landed in at least three disasters in the last 15 years and those disasters are absolutely heartbreaking because you can see a person dying because of a drug and that is what had made, made me very very so mycophenolate came as a complete rescue of air in this particular entity if it is lung specific damage and the immune process is limited to the lung mycophenolate is one of the best choices at this point in time so i would i would choose it in that territory of course if it is not beyond the lung then one has to think of things like methotrexate things like azathioprine because they will work on the entire body also some other body parts also will have inflammatory process in some other connective tissue diseases but hypersensitivity pneumonia i would typically go in favor of using mycophenolate as a first choice unless until the patient is completely non affording and cannot just cannot take mycophenolate then only i will expose him to uh, uh, azathioprine azathioprine has you know in fact it was brompton's uh, magic cocktail once upon a time that we would use steroids as a therapeutic and nac and i think if you really see from Hello? Life, all of them have practically disappeared for all for all practical purposes for a lung specific ild my first choice is my personally for a lung non specific ild that means it is there everywhere in the body i would work in tandem with the rheumatologist and then azathioprine methotrexate everything uh, becomes a part of the game as relevant and as as discussed so get that. that right dose of immunosuppressant what uh, exactly yeah. is there i have seen patients uh, with sarcoidosis they we get a euphoria once you get a diagnosis and we see the literature 1 mg per kg body weight we jump on load using 60 mg that's the one we should do so the immunosuppression is a real art in get in the correct dose without a side effect and we get a minimal effect to get the disease Absolutely. under control Absolutely. that is going to come if you keep on doing that over a longer period of time and a longer period of follow up and after discussion and all we'll get it right and uh, that needs some kind of experience of treating the ild with immunosuppressant over a period of time and follow up because people have landed with high dose immunosuppressant and pcp with 60 mg steroid with osteoporotic with diabetic and complications they have died so we just needed 5 mg or 7.5 mg you don't have to go uh, more than 40 mg that's what i feel and when you go by a book it's 1 mg you calculate it's not going to work it's 20 mg is sometimes good enough absolutely steroids well and immunosuppressants very yeah. very well said you have to balance your side effects all the time all throughout the year because it's a, it's your job with a choice second is uh, like if we have to use a combination like if the patient is on steroid like one uh, uh, dr anul lakhanpal has asked the patient is on hypersensitive neuritis uip pattern but progressing on uh, 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 steroid and azathioprine then we should be withdrawing the uh, uh, the steroids and then adding antifibrotics like when the antifibrotic role is kicking and the third is question the most common that is being asked is fibrotic nsip that is one uh, area where this antifibrotic ha may be having some role please sir elaborate no i i will try to answer it in a particular or getting into a concept mm. so usually our experience of treating ipf it is a fibrosing ild and we know about it we need antifibrotic and nobody is questioning or debating that antifibrotic as required for ipf so the problem is a newer concept which is available in spite of doing the mdt biopsy and treatment follow up everything there are 10% of the diseases which are unclassifiable fibrosis and they are progressive fibrosis and even hp in a late stage in fibrotic disease they 
behave like a fibrosing ild and the progression of the natural history of the disease they behave like ipf in uh, in the downhill course and even nsip behaves they are grouped under progressive fibrosing ild so when the study like inbuilt tried when they tried using the drugs so the nintinanib one is uh, required the extension perfinadone is just limited to uh, the ipf alone nintinanib the extensions and the um, the therapy related things have gone behind uh, beyond ipf that is one is nsip fibrosing ild it has been emerging and it has been proven second thing is ctd ild scleroderma that is been proven and it can be used as anti fibrotic and even in hp in late stages apart using from mycophenolate and azathioprine or whatever using after the steroid in a late stages even anti fibrotic role is been uh, there so in terms of comparing and if you are wanting to use for all other indications apart from ipf for a fibrosing ild nintinanib stands the choice if there is no cost constraint that's been very clear so the problem with nintinanib if this is the cost only okay perfinadone is a pill burden which is a problem nowadays we are getting 400 mg uh, perfinadone and 600 mg perfinadone and 1800 our indian patients definitely tolerate and there is much debate that they can go up to 2400 4000 2400 3 that's what is the study says and 2400 we can give up to four tablets uh, so in terms of choosing as an anti fibrotic in ipf there is nothing in perfinadone and nintinanib no problem you can choose anything and cost better you can use pill burden is less tolerating side effects you can use in terms of non ipf fibrosing ilds nintinanib stands the choice right. clear sir, sir, okay and if it is not responding to anything and it's not fitting and it's progressive there is no harm in combining uh, perfinadone and nintinanib though i have my own reservation because uh, when the pill burdens were high i was very difficult to convince him to take more pills now nintinanib is 2 and perfinadone is 3 up to 5 tablets and it is possible and uh, i don't know about both our hepatotoxicity that is the limiting factor but uh, studies should tell us combination should work or not and uh, this can be uh, this thing cost limitation nintinanib is better if pure ipf only perfinadone is still the choice nintinanib is secondary to the dex if is other fibrosing ild nintinanib if the cost keeps getting down people starts using nintinanib more than the perfinadone i feel sir uh, whatever the present sir dr nsh krishna Uh, where would you see the future of ild management both the faculties the concluding question of the day yeah what do you see in future yeah. of ild yeah. so i'll 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 take that but i'll continue on the hiranapa's thought process a little further on that and about nintadanib and perfinadon nintadanib has been badly marketed in this country i mean let us face it i mean they have made a mess of it and they should have come down with the price indianized it that molecule would have done so much so better because it's a molecule with so much quality you can see it just two pills a day person would be very happy to take that there was no question it has been bad marketing strategy which has created whatever their compulsions are forget it indians just could not afford it as simple as that even today they are not the other no. second part second part of it is the moment it becomes non you know the moment it becomes desperate for example somebody is awaiting a lung transplant you will invariably see a par and people like him want while they are awaiting lung transplant so desperate times ask for desperate measures and people start becoming tolerant once or all of a sudden so often i used to use this as a technique that i would give a give up somebody a prescription of nintadanib and then say because he was not tolerating perfinadone and suddenly after knowing the price of nintadanib he would become a perfinadone tolerant you create an intinanib fever uh, fear to take okay, perfinadone absolutely and he starts tolerating it i do that i do that sometimes absolutely and and if you really see you are you are going to get another disaster like this called favipiravir which is coming the loading dose is 9 tablets twice daily follow up dose is 4 tablets twice daily so you are talking of pill burden look at it and if somebody tells you you will probably live if you take this tablets i'll solve nine tablets so it's daily first day don't worry about it so it depends on the mind game of desperacy versus 
apprehension of how much pill burden so pill burden is a mild game and we have to fight it we have to address it we have to talk to the patient and finally we will we'll get so now we have perfinadone coming up in the, within uh, like with uh, uh, 600 mg yes, i sir, think that has done wonder sir the, that that that, 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 really that, that creates so much so much ease basically if about using it so it becomes so much so easy so i think we will go beyond that and, and now the last part of the question so where where do we see the future in future there is no role for people like me who are doing biopsy that is what one thing i feel because i think we will go away more and more away from bron bi biopsies because bronchol velar lavage alone can give you so much information right now we are not researching enough on this particular territory in our country our understanding of bal is limited to only infections and up to um, up to an extent cytospin and you know some amount of cellularity concern but so many markers so many things which are being studied ranging from spd what not i mean there are so many of them self exploited uh, so so many of the markers i uh, are emerging and if you really see the bal may become the next you know lung biopsy liquid lung biopsy that may be the future of the diagnostics if you really ask me and of course the ct patterns the ct patterns are emerging better and better every day and you will probably start identifying many things by the ct signatures combine them with a molecular signature with a bal and you will be on with the diagnosis so then the clinician will be left with fibrosing and non fibrosing sorting it out and then taking those calls so i think our job will become easier and easier so this is where i see the future uh, hiranappa will talk about the future on therapeutics possibly okay uh, in terms of therapy we have done well with the uh, medical thoracoscopy and uh, cryobiopsy fitching and we are knowing more about the disease and more uh, biopsies and been interpreted and the problem comes in management uh, uh, used to this management we didn't had much of the armamentarium earlier we used to give a cocktail of misinac azathioprine and other things and that has been evolved over a period of time and now they have many drugs like perfenadone only if the cost comes down and intinab is there and perfinadone is there and uh, the clarity of using perfinadone on where earlier we uh, somebody has started we used to stop okay it is not U uip and all now they have started mdt and getting that uip pattern on ct the clarity has come and more and more and more and the churning out of ipfs out of the all ilds has become more and more and that is been adding and there are two specific therapies and it is going to work and in terms of uh, lung transplant progressing uh, in future and probably the lung transplant as uh, aspects of it people are taking and it might evolve over the future Absolutely. in terms of uh, treatment strategy people are not going to stay on oxygen over a long period of time and people can afford uh, mm -hmm. lung transplantation with complications and the only thing it is open uh, on like unlike liver and the kidneys where it is a closed space they are more prone to infection and bronchiolitis and uh, there are new centers which are emerging in terms of lung transplant especially young and life expectancy is more in 50s and 60s who are very very sick lung transplant is the way forward probably in india but there is a option for uh, all this palliative aspects of that involvement of palliative care is also been more and more in terms of ild and we are learning more uh, cts and that our understanding of ct have more made us uh, and our uh, diagnostics tools in uh, lymph nodes assessment even if ild with lymph nodes the uh, possibility is when we are touching all the organs and doing the lymph nodes and all our understanding of a disease process has been um, become much better and we are dissecting the disease as well and we are treating them well with more specific therapy if you mentioned like toxic therapy the earlier and treating the well treating them well it is one of the one of the um, milestone that will be you know uh, taken care of in future and one thing i am sure that that it will help in future is kl6 the um, the role of kl6 exactly. yeah so, kl6 spd2 are uh, under here so I think as a biomarker he was very right about the lung transplant because that is going to help so many young people who are otherwise dying because of a single lung organ failure single organ failure so early in their life so all fibrotic ilds or fibrosing ilds will be considered for a lung transplant including hp and you know few years back we would not have even thought this entity you know because people used to ridicule us said, in in india lung transplant it will never work and today if you really see not a single death has happened in the entire covid pandemic in a lung transplant patient so all of them are still safe so mind you that you know we used to think that they will just die right like rats with infection which is not happening 
So I think that is that there is no doubt about it. When we started our lung transfer and open, it was unimaginable. People said, "What what nonsense are you talking about?" And Upar in last six months has been seeing. Uh, last three months is complete shutdown, but he was seeing twelve patients on every single OPD for evaluation of lung transplant on in Pune. Coming all the all the way from Chennai, so if you really see, and he was doing something like ten such such remote OPDs. So Jaipur was one of them. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, Delhi with Dr. Deepak Kalwar was one of them. So so many places. So I think the whole story of lung transplant is going to go ahead. India is very rich in this raw material also because reckless driving will continue and brain dead patients will be always available. So that is a sad, ironical part that the lungs will always be available in good time. For for people so, who really need it. So first of all, I must thank Dr. Anish Krishna. Anish Krishna, Krishna has committed us ten minutes more. Like it's five six minutes we have taken. So yeah. we can take a two minute answer for the question. Uh, yeah. Dr. Nikhilesh has asked a very important question, and it will be two minute answer. Like yeah. how to follow up an ILD? Very very basic. Like what frequency will be get, getting the X ray? What frequency will be getting the CT scan? What frequency will be get, getting the six minute walk test? PFT, like when to utilize what? Uh, these investigations, how to follow? Ah, uh, once in three months. Once in three months. Usually, the functional assessment is more important, not the CT assessment, because CT response the reversibility is very tough. Unless it is like granular granular matters, or it is more of uh, NSIP or a ground glass appearance. Fibrotic, it's already gone. You need to assess the functional assessment. Usually, it is six minute walk test and a regular PFT. I'm not even talking about DLCO. If the FEC what we are following up we normally don't look at we have a habit of looking at fe1 in asthma fe1 in copd fec and we need to monitor if at the baseline if you see the 2 liters at a lung function at the end of 3 months or 6 months we do the pft alone without getting into the 6 minute walk test if it is 2 liters that is 2000 ml so 10% amounts to 200 ml so if the less than 10% of drop should be there in next 3 or 6 months or a yearly so if the drop is more than 10% then it is progressive boss okay and next thing is if if 6 minute walk test is a one thing which we need to look at 6 minute walk test we don't look at exercise hypoxia is one thing which is which is bad and if there is a two more than drop of 50 meters in less than 6 months 3 months or 60 meters drop if they are walking about 250 meters then it is more than 10% that's where we need to document our uh pfts in ilds and 6 minute walk test these two are good enough for us apart from the history symptoms and other things we sh- should keep their endurance and a muscle strength with a pulmonary rehab and other things and looking at oxygen and that's the way we look at and that's where our indications of transplant uh, listing comes Doctor Nathan, you have to add yeah, something. I think this is brilliantly put, Tehran. I think that the value of six-minute walk test is unbelievably good. It has matched DLCO. In fact, it has been better than that in many a times. And another thing is, you know, the prognostication. One of the most important prognostic features is oxygenation after exercise. So, if somebody is retaining at the end of one year. whatever the diagnostic label irrespective of whether it is ipf it is non ipf whatever the diagnosis is if at the end of one year somebody is not becoming hypoxic and not becoming hypoxic even on exertion that means he has a good prognostic index so, last so that is that is one up. part of it the Dr. other yeah, i would like somebody start i would like to add doctor add one, one more tool one more tool uh, yes or no Ad, have you Combine steroid plus anti-fibrotic. Any of your patient? Yes or no? Yes, yes, absolutely. yes, yes, yes. No hesitation saying that. Fine. So I have combined it. I would like to tell that pleuro parenchymal fibrosis, which is VATS proven, it has a differential. Uh, this thing we don't have a specific therapy. I combined with a nintinani with a low dose maintenance five mg of steroid. I think now we'll be concluding the session. It was a marvelous. I like this session. I would just say, wow, what, what. the pool of knowledge what the ocean of knowledge we have seen from our great great speakers and uh, we have tried to cover all the aspect from the questions also the questions were wonderful and it, it has li- literally uh, covered all the possible scenarios in ild all the possible futures back everything so i would like to thank cci for giving us platform to uh, conduct this webinar dr nsh krishna brain child these webinar series have been wonderful 
Hats off to Dr. Krishna sir for imagining this. And and we know what and you know yeah. what and the kind of effort he puts in in yes. everything is brilliant. No question. No words about it. This 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 so much of uh, thankfulness to him and CCI and we thank our audience who have paid a lot of attention and a lot of questions have been put up. Thank you so much and stay tuned thank with you. CCI. There's something and many more things. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, CCI team. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.